Welcome to this week's episode of Talk of the Town. My name is Philip Swiskett, and I am back with my good friend and co-host, Dr. Kenneth Harper from Vein Specialist of the South. Now, if you have questions about your veins, give my friends at Vein Specialist of the South a call, and they will get you the answers that you deserve. Now, if you're one of our brand new viewers on WMAZ, one, thanks so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Here's what you can expect every week, a conversation between me, Dr. Harper, and someone in the community or a story in the community that you need to know about. This week is no different. We are talking to Dave Pridemore, who is the executive director at Camp Grace. And we're really excited about this conversation because look, just a couple years ago, I was out here at Camp Grace and it looks totally different now. So Dave, we cannot wait to hear about all the great things going on out here. Thanks so much for joining us. Glad you're here. So Dave, I've been excited about this uh, opportunity to interview you for since we set it up a couple months ago. Okay. So you're visionary. Tell us, and this is this is your your baby, right? right. So people may not know a lot about Camp Grace, so it's your opportunity. Well, Share a little bit about why why Camp Grace. Well, I was a pastor in a church, and a friend of mine, when the towers came down in New York, um, asked me to come up and do chaplaincy work at Ground Zero. So. September 20th, I was there and it was incredible. And I thought I went up there to do chaplaincy work. But my friend, um, he was a drug addict kid growing up in New York. And when he was 16, someone asked him to go to an overnight camp. Now, believe it or not, that was the first time he'd ever been out of the city. Mm -hmm. We went to this Christian camp, found the Lord, came back, went to Bible college, ended up starting Manhattan Bible Church, Manhattan Christian Academy, been there 35 years. And he, he always wanted to have a camp outside the city for kids who couldn't afford it. And he, he was also a chaplain for the New York Knicks. And uh, so Charlie Ward and Allen Houston helped him build a, a camp about an hour and a half outside the city called uh, Hoop Heaven, right? Now I played junior college basketball, I love basketball. I went up the next year and saw it in action and I had never seen life transformation and life change like I did that two weeks I was there. And so I came back to my plush office in my big church and I couldn't get this off my mind. And I said, how many camps do we have in Georgia that are what I call high quality, high capacity, serving thousands of only inner city at risk kids? And I could not find one. And I was on the beach and I wrote out, well, what would it look like? And I came up with three camps on 300 acres and served 3000 kids. And so I, I kept thinking about this and I'd never raised money. I'd never started a camp. I'd never been to camp. I knew nothing about it. But I wrote a book about this. And what I say in the book is I was kind of wholly miserable because I knew God was calling me to go start it, but I didn't want to do it. So finally, one day, I knew it was time to do it. I walked into my pastor and I quit that day. And that was in 04, no, 05, right? And so right. what did you tell your wife before you did this? Well, she was a guidance counselor at our high school. And I said, honey, don't quit your day job. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's Obviously, how, y'all been how praying about it, yeah. I'm sure. Yeah. Wasn't a total surprise there. Yeah, it wasn't total. Yeah. Right. Dave, it's, it's one of those things. We just got off of a, a, a tour of the camp itself. It's right. really hard to describe just how large this place is and how involved it is and just the caliber of all of the facilities that are involved here you guys have a rock wall that is incredible yeah. i don't think i've seen one that big anywhere and it's yeah. and it's sitting here yeah. talk to us a little bit about the different things that you guys offer at this camp okay yeah well the rock wall for an example uh i saw it in dick sporting goods in buckhead and i tried to call the uh, district manager talk to him the regional manager everybody i couldn't get the first base but i knew the the uh the headquarters of Dix was in Pittsburgh, and my brother and sister-in-law lived there. And I called Bud and said, Bud, do you know anybody at Dix? He said, I know one guy. He's on the Christian school board with me. I said, unbelievable. Give me his name. Tell him I'm going to call him tomorrow. Well, I called him the next day, and one of his job was, was to sell all those rock walls. I got to the very person. And, of course, I told him, I said, Bud told you what I did. I can't afford that. You need to give it to me. He said, let me call you tomorrow. He called me the next day and said, if you can take it down with a licensed bonded contract in three nights, you can have it. And I've got a friend that lives down in Lazella. And I didn't realize this, but he has a structural uh, firm in Birmingham and he actually manufactures steel. So what you saw over there, he manufactured the steel, set it up, took the wall down and put it up as a gift. Now, 
behind us is a $600,000 swimming pool. Uh, I just tell you a couple of stories, but in this book I wrote, they're filled with things like this because I know God wants this camp for our kids. And so I had a little gal, a foster, uh, African-American foster girl. Her name is Alasia, and she came and uh, she was put in a cabin with a gal who was from Thomaston. This gal, African-American gal, had a full scholarship to Georgia. Very smart girl. Alasia's story and Mary's story almost identical. The mom, moms were in prison, didn't know their dads. But Alasia fell in love with Mary. Mary was going somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. Mary invested in her life. She goes home, her foster dad calls me and says, what did you do to my foster daughter? I thought I was in trouble. I said, what do you mean? Well, she's praying, she's reading her Bible. She's talking to me about wanting to go to college. By the way, Elijah's here this week. She's a junior at Georgia State. And he said, I love what you guys do. If I can ever help you, let me know. And man, I love people say that to me. Right? <laughs> I said, well, what do you do? He said, I built the Olympic pool in Atlanta. I built pools for 25 years. I said, man, I need a pool. And so I have a principle we operate on, as you see the nice facility. God gave his best, so we're gonna build the best. So I gave him a picture of a subdivision pool I lived in. Junior Olympic, zero entry, mushroom, 130,000 gallon. And he said, whoa, Dave, I built that for over half a million. I said, I know, that's what we want. And he sent 40 guys out here, and you see it behind me. It's massive. Most of our kids learn to swim there. Most of them don't know how to swim. Really? So we give swimming lessons all week long. Huh. But that is just a couple stories. And, and so we know that God has called us to build the nicest camp in Georgia for what sometimes society calls the worst kids, but they're great kids. And so we've been doing that now for 18 years. So kids have been coming out here for camp. Yeah, we've had 14,000 kids since we started out here. We wow. bought this property and started in 09 here. So what do you see culturally that, you know, we all see it. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us how this opportunity for these kids to come to Camp Grace can overcome some of those barriers that a lot of kids have. Yeah, we are really big. This is called Camp Grace for a reason. Right? For by grace you've been saved through faith. Grace to me is um, what happened to me when I came to the Lord. And my whole identity changed. We have a verse we like in here. It's, if anyone's in Christ, you're a new creation. The old Dave passed away. The new has come. So we build these kids up. So many of our kids are told they can never do anything. They'll never be anything. And when they leave here, some of them feel like they can walk on water. Because that's our goal. Our goal is not only to share with them the importance of a relationship with the Lord, but also their new identity in Christ, right? And so we do that every week. And we they come back for a week at, uh, in, the, in the summertime. And then we have two other weekends where we, we get them back and we work with them. But it, it's important because the culture they live in sometimes is, as you know, very tough. So many of our kids who come for the first time, have never been out of their neighborhood. Kind of like my friend in, in uh, New York. So we just try to build into them and we do it all year long. Like I have staff that will show up at their ministries. And keep in mind, we never take any kids off the street. Like you're involved in campus clubs. We'll multiply campus clubs 59 times in four states. That's how many partners we have, right? And so, a partner will bring 50 kids, right? Next year, they may bring 70 kids. But if anybody calls us from Atlanta, from Macon, we'll say, what side of town do you live on? Okay, there is a ministry and you have to check with the leader and through that leader, you can come. Mm -hmm. Because when they come here for a week, it's very, it's really awesome for them, but we want follow up all year round. Mm -hmm. And that's why I was telling you, we have a CIT programs, counselor and training. We need to encourage these kids and let them know that uh, God has a purpose for them and they can be a leader. So at 15, they can be a leader. 60% of our CITs this summer are little dudes that started at seven, right? 35% of our paid college counselors are little dudes that started at seven and eight. So they're a CIT from 15 to 18. And at 18, they actually can get a paid position. But we, we you know, 
We're building memories in their life that they can tell their kids about the camp they went to. So many kids who live in the inner city, they can't tell their kids about memories they have of camp. There may be people in your audience as I'm talking, they're thinking about their camp experience. I have a book called Camp by Michael Eisner, right? Mm -hmm. And someone asked him one time, he was uh, the CEO of Disney and, and he was in uh, a meeting, a lot of people and someone asked him, what is the institution that has been the most significant impact on you for the job you're doing today? And he said, I've never been asked that camp, uh, question and I blurted out camp because mm -hmm. he thought about camp and all that he went through and learned at camp and he attributed his success to the things he learned at camp. So it is important, although it's a week, they come back every year, a couple times during the year. I think we're making a big impact and I have a hundred stories I could tell you about life change, but we don't have time. <laughs> <laughs> Dave, I've got one more question I want to ask you, but first we have to take a quick break and hear a word from our sponsor. I'm a mom and a professional outside sales representative, always on the go. I enjoy spending time working in my yard, shopping, and going on long walks. After being pregnant with my second child, I was left with terrible varicose veins in both legs. This caused heaviness, pain, and swelling, which I dealt with for years, but it was more of a cosmetic issue. I wanted great looking legs. Then a friend told me about vein specialist of the South. This office wasn't what I expected. They listened to my concerns and the staff were extremely caring and informative about the procedure and what to expect. Plus, the procedure had minimal downtime. Since having the procedure, my legs feel amazing and I have my youthful legs back. I would have addressed it years ago if I'd have known how easy it was. If you want five-star vein care, I encourage you to call Vein Specialist of the South today. I was looking on your website and according to your website and other data that I had seen, one in four children live in poverty. 38,000 children just in the state of Georgia are actually homeless. And you guys are able to bring a lot of these kids here week after week, year after year to be able to invest in them and see the life change that you're talking about. I'm curious though, where exactly does that funding come from and how can someone support that cause? Well, you saw the facility and we have 455 acres and we have 500 beds and all the facilities that free. And so I was a businessman most of my life, uh, working for the Bell Telephone Company. And so when I started, I had to try to figure out a way, because here I build a multi-million dollar complex and my clients are poor. That's not a very good business plan. Mm -hmm. So I went to CEOs I knew. And I said, would you guys sponsor 10 kids to camp? And I have 145 of those today. I want 3,000 kids by 2026. That means I need 300 CEOs. And my CEOs right now, I have a, a little program this year, each one reach one. I want each one of them to get one other CEO to sponsor 10 kids. Listen, an investment in these kids will change cities. I, I believe that, will change schools because they're coming out here, they're getting a new, uh, idea about, about what their life could be like. And then they're taking that back into their neighborhood, into their school, and into their family. So it's, it's corporate and uh, we have some churches, but mainly, mainly the corporate uh, world helps us. So on our tour, we saw a lot of uh, young people having a great time. Yeah. So share a couple of the, the venues and the, the cool things that the kids yeah. get to do. Well, here we have uh, three lakes, and one lake we call the Activity Lake. We have a big uh, Wibbit. We call it a Wibbit. You might have seen it like in Lake Lanier, the big blow-ups are in the ocean. Well, our whole Activities Lake is that. It's a big obstacle course. They love that. We have uh, a big swing. It will swing you as high as a pine tree. And I tell the kids, if you want to lose your lunch, go there right after lunch. So if you're not from <laughs> Georgia, the pine trees are pretty tall out here at Camp Grace. Yeah. Yeah. So we have, we have that, we have archery. Right. Uh, we, they love field games because a lot of them are in the city and at night we have, I mean, we have hundreds of acres to run on. And so we, we develop field games. Uh, we have a fishing lake that is stocked. Uh, I was telling you yesterday, they caught about two five pound catfish. And the thing about uh, Camp Grace, everybody wants the Spirit Point Award at the end of the week. And if you kiss the fish you caught, <laughs> you get 50 Spirit Points. 
Doc, Everybody I'm going to leave that kiss. to you. <laughs> Everybody kisses their fish. Right? Uh, yeah, so we have that. And uh, there's, there's just so many activities that, like, you came through and you saw all these kids with all this yuck all over them. It was food. We have crud wars. And on Thursday, we get them all wet, and then they throw flour at each other, and then oats at each other, then peas at each other. And they have a big war, and then they go down to the lake. I, I say, on Thursdays, our fish like it. But the big thing about it is, believe it or not, we, we build a huge uh, auditorium where we do a mostly Christian rap, and we have fun in there. We have an AM show. We have the Power Hour. And a lot of the kids, they do a lot around here, but they will tell you one of the things they love the best is when they can get together in the auditorium. Mm -hmm. And they put their arms around each other. They're singing. They're praising. They're loving on each other. And like on Wednesday nights, we don't like just to talk about principles. We demonstrate it. So a big value of Jesus was to serve one another. You're a doctor. He gave you that gift, not for you, but to help others. Every gift he gives us, he wants us to give away. So we talk about serving, and then we have them sit down in a chair, and then we have our donors come sit in the other chair and we wash their feet and we put a brand new pair of tennis shoes and socks on every kid every summer. Wow. I ordered 1,700 pair for this summer. Next summer, <laughs> oh Lord. So, <laughs> how do you know what sizes they get? You don't have any. Yeah, it's, it's on the, uh, it's on the oh, their application the form. Application. Okay, good. And hopefully it didn't grow too much. Uh, that, well, some of yeah. them. I mean, I bought a bunch of 16s. Because really? they're 16 weeks. Oh, yeah. Uh, 16s. Yeah. Wow. I just hope they don't go out of them. Yeah. So, you know, we're on w WMAZ now. We've yeah. got a ton of followers. The show keeps growing. We're super yeah. blessed to be able to have that. Mm -hmm. Inevitably, there's going to be a kid that's watching this show yeah. and is interested about coming to camp this yeah. summer. Talk mm -hmm. to us, and you've touched on this a little bit, but talk to us about what a standard day at camp entails yeah. from the time you wake up to the time you go to bed. Okay. You're going to wake up and you're going to uh, come to breakfast. Our dining hall seats 800. Wow. We have uh, kids tell us that's another thing too. We do uh, family style round tables. The kids don't get up. We have mission teams that we serve them so they can sit around and talk. A lot of them don't get that. They go back and then they, they do cabin cleanup. After cabin cleanup, then they do, uh, they, they come to power hour, right? And power hour is a review of the day before. We have games, they have to come up and we have a little teaching, but it's mostly crazy fun. Right. And then after that, they will go to their electives. Electives could be like we have guys making cupcakes. Right. And we, we have a lot of sports, but we have drum beat. We have just a lot of different electives. And but they select the two or three electives they want to do all week long. Then after that, we go to lunch. After lunch, we have fob. Fob is flat on bump. All right. <laughs> they just need about 45 minutes just to chill. Right. <laughs> And then after that, they'll come and we have a rotation for like, we have a high ropes course. We have two 800 foot zip lines. Uh, we have uh, the big Wibbit uh, obstacle course in the lake. And we have all of these other activities that we wanna run all these kids through. So, so there'll be a schedule to make sure everybody gets in the pool, everybody gets in the lake, everybody canoes and all that kind of stuff. We have everything that any high capacity camp would have. And so then after that, they would uh, come to dinner. Dinner's at 6.30. And then in the evening, uh, we always have a big field game of some kind, right? They, they might, have to, might have some monsters chasing them. They might have to catch them and take their counselor and they have to put them in jail, big jail in the middle of the field. But the thing that we see that they love, they love to run and run and run. And so we give them plenty of opportunity to do that. And then on, on the rainy days, we have indoor activities. We have a big gym. One of the activities that's fun to watch is we have about two or 3,000 balls in a big container in the ceiling of the gym. So we line cabins up on each side. And we there, there's 3,000 rubber bouncy balls, little ones. We dump that. They go everywhere. So you see kids, the one with the most balls, the cabin that gets the most balls, they get like 500 spirit points. <laughs> they, they do anything to do this, right? So we have, we have everything is programmed, and every day we have a card that shows what we're going to do 
from time to time. And uh, I'll give you that card you can take with you. But uh, my program team could probably tell you better about what, what we do. But we utilize the entire facility, right? We even have nature walks. Last year, kids getting on the bus. I said, hey, what was your favorite thing of the whole camp? Guess what he said? I saw a real live deer. Can you imagine? We out here, we see him all the time. But for him and all the things that he did, first time in his life, he saw a live deer. Wow. That made an impact on his life. Another kid said, hey, how'd you like camp? He said, Pastor Dave, I loved it. When I come back next week, can I, next year, can I still eat all I want? <laughs> <laughs> but see, out here, they're never, they're never hungry. They're safe. The, the cabins are clean. The hot water is always hot. Every cabin has a little drawer for them. For them, we give them their uh, toothbrushes and everything. We have everything that a kid would need. We have uh, bathing suits. We have clean underwear because some kids come and some kids come with nothing. Some kids will come with a little black uh, plastic bag, and that's all they have. So we know, like, look, a lot of these kids don't swim. We spend so much money on swimsuits. You know, one little one little cousins. They came last year. They had a, a, a tank top and some shorts sewn together, and they were changing it out, going into the swimming pool, until we found it out, and then we gave them a swimsuit. So just just different, you know. But the uh, kids are wonderful, and they they uh, if you come here on a Friday when they get ready to go home, even the kids that come and they're tough, you know, they're right Wednesday they're jumping in the lake, they're kids again, and then on Friday they're crying. They don't want to go home. There's obviously a lot of stuff here for kids to be able to do. But in addition to that, you guys have a lot of opportunities for corporate retreats, weddings, different things like that. Can you touch on some of the other non-kids stuff that you guys do? Yeah. Well, one of our, in our business plan, we knew we have all these kids, thousands in the summer. But you still have to fund the entire thing. Like in the summertime, our electric bill is about $15,000 a month. Oh, my goodness. Well, what we wanted to do was to make the facility so nice corporations, men's retreats, uh, youth retreats. We've had youth retreats of 400 people, 400 kids. So this place is available for any retreat anybody would want to come. And and like I told you when you come, I, I think we're the best kept secret in Georgia. People come out here and take a tour and they say, this place is amazing. How come I didn't know about it? But, and I'm so thankful for you all letting me share with your audience about Camp Grace. And like if they go to uh, thecampgrace.com, not Camp, Camp Grace, but thecampgrace.com, they will be able to see what we have. They will be able to schedule a, a retreat. And also, if you have kids that cannot afford to go to camp, you can go to the Camp Grace, find out who to contact and who our partners are in your city, and you can hook up with them and you can be at Camp Grace next summer. But we want to, next summer, we'll probably, we add about four to 500 kids every year. So, we started with 200. So how much does it cost to sponsor a kid to come out here for a year? Well, it costs us $360, okay? And the kids come out in the summertime, and then they have an opportunity to come back at fall for a fall break, and then what we call recharge in the winter. We think we, they need to recharge their battery, come back out here, and we go over what we did in the summer, and we get them ready for the next summer. So how many kids come back over and over again? We have 87% of all our kids that start, come back every year from age seven to 17. So what do you, tell us a, a story or two of some of, you already shared some, but uh, a memorable story about one of the kids and what they're doing now. Okay, here's Irwin. Irwin, a uh, Hispanic guy, gave his mom fits. He would go to Sunday school when he was little and he would make her cry because he was so bad. By age 10, he was in a gang. He was doing drugs, he was uh, drinking, he was in a heavy metal band, and he felt sorry for his mom because she would bring kids out here. And at, when he was 14, he felt sorry for her and he said, okay, I'll go to camp with you. Well, on a Thursday night at the amphitheater, after all the fun he had, now remember, he doesn't have to be holding up this image in the city. He's out here and just be a kid. We went to the amphitheater and we did a, uh, <laughs> a message, right? And it was a gospel message. All he said was, I feel, I felt so dirty. I felt so ashamed. Erwin gave his heart to the Lord that night. And he went back. And although he was a weird guy at school, his alphabet of high school, now he's weird again because he quit wearing all black. He's no longer in heavy metal. 
and he's carrying his Bible everywhere he went. He became the chaplain of Alpharetta High School, right? Mm -hmm. So his mom was so taken back that the fact that not only her son, but especially her son, was so changed at Camp Grace, she started a ministry in Roswell and Alpharetta. She brings 150 kids, Hispanic kids, kids here every year. So she sees the value of what overnight camp can do in the heart of a kid. Oh, by the way, Erwin proposed to his fiance at the very place at the amphitheater he was saved. Yeah. And he got married at the same place. <laughs> and Erwin now is in the army. You know, we look at society and we say, oh, everything's terrible, mm. you know, and what's the hope? And really, to me, the hope is one person at a time. Yeah. Exactly. And that's what Camp Grace is all about. Yeah. Even on our website, we say changing Georgia, one child at a time. And we really mean that. Dave, that's fantastic. We so appreciate the work that you do here. On this side of heaven, there's no telling how many lives that you have actually impacted. And we're really grateful for all the work you do. Well, thank you guys for having me. Thank you guys so much for watching us this week. And stay tuned for where me and Dr. Harper might show up. You never know where it might be. I'm a nursing professor, mother of four, and very active, playing in sports my entire life. After each pregnancy, my legs got worse, and I started running again to lose baby weight, but nothing helped how my legs looked. I was self-conscious in a bathing suit or shorts, and my legs ached after sitting or standing too long. That's when I went to vein specialists of the South. The ultrasounds they performed were very thorough, and they explained everything in detail. I knew then I picked the right place for vein care. During my procedures, I was never uncomfortable and they played my favorite praise music the whole time. I can't say enough good things about the staff. I've never been to an office where everyone I came in contact with was smiling and happy to help in every way. I'm very happy with how my legs look now. It's a drastic difference and I have confidence in myself again. If you need vein care, I encourage you to call Vein Specialists of the South today. It's the best choice you'll make.